Well, good morning, and welcome to West Springs Online. If you have your Bibles, open to Isaiah chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 1 through verse 5. Isaiah chapter 2. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established in the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes among many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have graciously preserved it over the generations, and now, by your Holy Spirit, you speak through it to us. Let us hear you speak this morning, and let us be changed as a result of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace means a lot of different things to different people. What does peace mean to a soldier? What does peace mean to the mother of a colicky baby? What does peace mean to the child whose parents won't stop fighting? Peace usually means the end of something. The end of a war. The end of that non-stop crying. The end of those heart-wrenching disputes. Now according to the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 2 verse 14, the angels sang at the birth of Jesus, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So what kind of peace were the angels referring to? Is there a promise of peace here that addresses the issues we just mentioned? No, not really. Because all those were at best temporary forms of peace. Wars break out again. Babies will cry again. Relationships will get strained again. The peace that only the Messiah can bring is a personal, permanent kind of peace. Peace between self-absorbed, willful, sinful people like you and me, and the Holy God. Those whom God favors are those who understand, receive, and embrace that truth. I believe that the Bible teaches and promises that as a result of the peace God established between himself and people like you and me, we can have peace in and with ourselves. We can live outside of a lot of the disquiet and anxiousness and regret that can take hold of any of us who live in this fallen and uncertain world. We can be at peace with our circumstances and with our trials. We can be at peace with our own frailties, moral frailties, physical ones, emotional ones. Now, I need to make this aside. Some among us may suffer from medical and psychological afflictions that produce paralyzing fear and deep worry and dark despair. These types of conditions are not remedied by exercising more faith in God's peace. Neither are they the result of an insufficient trust in God. They are conditions that we certainly look to God to minister to. And we believe that through his common grace, there are treatments which can address these symptoms and bring comfort and considerable relief to you. While you struggle, we stand with you. We stand with you, we pray with you, and we love you. Okay, now moving on. I'd like to promise all of us this Christmas that you can have peace in all of your relationships. I'd love to promise that. But I can't. The Bible doesn't promise it either. It says, 
If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 18. We'll look at that again a little bit later. But that's a pretty realistic take on relational peace, isn't it? Peace is not a matter of what you want to occur. It's not going to be willed or even prayed into being by your efforts unilaterally. One can make a strong contribution to peacemaking, but the outcome of true peace is based on the others involved, be they individuals or groups or nations. Now this Advent, we have been looking at the hope that this season evokes. A long-awaited Savior finally comes to the world. Those of us who are his people today, we now await his return. And while we wait for his return, we have expectations that the promises to us will indeed show up in our lives. All this hope is not at all relegated to something like the maybe, the hope so. It's because God promised them these things aren't maybe, they are will be. In our passage this morning in Isaiah, he looks, at the, looks not at the first coming of the Messiah. That's not what Isaiah is seeing in this, in this vision here. It's not the first coming of the Messiah. He's looking further past that to his second coming. At the end of all things, world peace is fully established. But within Isaiah's prophetic vision, we find direction for us to live in God's peace today. Peace with him and peace in the world. The first thing we see is that peace is found in God's presence. Verse 2, it says, In the last days, the mount of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. Now, first off, the mountain of the Lord's temple is a way of expressing being in God's presence. This is where God is. It's, it's in a mountain, so it's high and elevated, but it is where God dwells. This is not meant, hear this, this is not meant to be an abstract concept or an experience outside of reality. Isaiah himself knows what the presence of the Lord is. He speaks of it in Isaiah chapter 6. And there is nothing vague about this experience. Very quickly, Isaiah chapter 6. I'll just read it to you. In the year King Uzziah saw it died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, and they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See? This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Now, we don't have time to go through that particular passage slowly, but I want to point out three things very quickly here. First of all, God is really present to Isaiah. He is in the presence of the Lord and it is by no means a casual encounter. When he is present to the Lord, Isaiah's first reaction is, woe is me, I am ruined. That's because God is holy. But to stay in God's presence, you've got to get fixed. Something from the altar has to come and manage and deal with your sin. Now, we have access to the presence of God by the sacrifice blood of Jesus. That was on the altar before God, and that's what cleanses us. The writer of the Hebrews says in chapter 10, verses 19, on to 22, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up 
for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. How do we get this kind of confidence before a holy God? The first months of fifth grade were miserable for me. I was distracted and careless with my work and somewhat disruptive in my behavior. My mother was having a difficult pregnancy and was on a lot of bed rest, and so I was sort of off my parents' radar. To make matters worse, my teacher, Mrs. Mitchell, had declared war on me. I got chewed out a lot, and then while she'd be upbraiding me, she'd take her knuckle and hit me underneath the chin. I had a stomach ache for six weeks straight, stressing over all of this. One Friday afternoon, as I was heading out the classroom door for a much needed, much needed reprieve from my fifth grade Shawshank, Mrs. Mitchell called me back to her desk. McDonald, she said, this is a note for your mother. Give it to her and don't you open it. Well, there goes my weekend. When my mom read the note, she got up out of her bed. She was on bed rest. She got up and she went to the phone. There were lots of uh-huh and I sees. And finally, very well, I'll have them at your home by 10 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> I looked at my mom aghast. She said, all I can say is apparently you've got something to learn. Next morning, 10 a.m., I am at her door. Come on in, she says. Mrs. Mitchell was a widow. She probably poisoned her husband. And she lived with her daughter and her family. They were home, but they weren't around. So Mrs. Mitchell led me down to the finished basement that had a TV, a punching bag, and a pool table. She said to me, McDonald, I am your teacher, am I not? I nodded. Well, today, I'm going to teach you how to shoot pool, rack them up. She was astonishing with a pool cue in her hand and patient in her instruction with me. I learned about how to break. I learned about angles and bank shots, getting spin on the cue ball, along with the rules of eight ball and straight pool. Over lunch, she told me that she had been hard on me because she knew I had much potential and God had gifted me with a sharp and inquisitive mind, her words, and I was wasting it. She said she believed I could be great, that I could be a leader in the class, I could be a leader in life. She said, you picked up pool in two hours. Wouldn't you love to pick up medicine or engineering or writing and excel at that for a lifetime? Well, that all starts in the fifth grade. Monday morning when school resumed, it was no longer a prison. It was a temple. Mrs. Mitchell hadn't changed. She was strict, demanding, and set the highest of standards. But now I understood that she was for me, and in that environment, I flourished. Now the analogy is clear. When we know that a holy and righteous God wants to be with us and sees such value in us, we flourish in his presence. We have the peace that Paul says in Philippians, the peace that passes all understanding. This peace the New Testament teaches us came at a great price, the blood of Jesus, for all those who put their trust in his work and don't rely on their own. But let's get real here. You won't hang on to that peace. You won't have confidence in that place of the presence of God if you aren't being transformed and changed by it. But that's the promised outflow. The second thing we see in this passage is that peace is found in godly 
practice. Look at verse 3 at the end. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Being in the Lord's presence leads us to the peace of walking in obedience. It is impossible to experience God's peace when your number one priority is sin. It's impossible to experience peace. There is repentance that we must be willing to make. We must stop doing what does not please God and start doing what does. Sometimes we think we want it both ways. We want God's peace and we want to cling to our favorite sins. We want God's peace but we want to be free to gossip. We want God's peace, but we want to get even with people we don't like. We want God's peace, but we don't want to stop criticizing our spouse. To experience God's peace, we have to make a choice to live either his way or ours. And, but when you consider the power of living in God's peace, the choice is easy to make, and the sacrifice, whatever that might be, is well worth it. Last thing. In God's presence and out of godly practice, we can make peace in this life with others. End of verse 4. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. As Isaiah sees the days that are promised to come, relational peace is now global because God's presence is just so everywhere and sin and sorrow have been banished. What is left to dispute about? If God's ultimate plan is that nation will not take up sword against nation, it stands to reason that his plan for us as individuals now is that we will not take up the sword against one another that we will let go of conflict and learn to live with one another in peace. So returning again to that passage in Romans chapter 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So the question comes, what does depend on you in those kinds of circumstances? Well, one thing for sure, what is it that you can let go of. If you don't take up the sword, what isn't worth fighting about anymore? What can you do? And this is the plowshares and pruning hooks thing. What can you do that enables growing and developing someone rather than conflicting with them? Now sure, there are times when interpersonal conflict, sharp disagreement, and strong rebuke are appropriate and unavoidable. But you and I know that more times often than not, we can diffuse or even ignore many disputes which really have no significant or meaningful importance. We don't need to assert or protect our rights or announce our status of being offended in many situations that we automatically do so. You know why? Because we serve a Savior who gave up his rights. He gave up his rightful place, his rightful status, his rightful throne to be our Prince of Peace. Do you hope for peace? You have it in the presence of God who invites you, who invites you to be with him and makes you able to be in his presence out of great cost to himself. And in that presence, that peace is experienced and maintained by walking with him in the light of the Lord, letting him make his ways yours. And that peace becomes a product of your life among others as you unilaterally determine to make peace with others as far as it depends on you. I leave you this morning with this blessing
from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, bless us with those words today and let them be ours in our life, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.